On October 11, 2011, in the small city of Leesburg, Virginia, a Syrian-American man was arrested by the FBI. The Syrian embassy uh, sent the person, a spy, to, you know, to take pictures of us, to, to monitor uh, our activities. Mohammed Suaid was indicted in federal court in Alexandria, accused of collecting information on Syrians residing in America who are actively opposing the regime of Syrian President Bashar Assad. Mohammed Suaid, he went to Damascus in June and he met with Bashar al-Assad and there are footage of that. He got money, he was paid very well to come here and attack anybody who's supporting the revolution and to hurt them even. The Suaid case set a precedent. For the first time, a Syrian believed to be involved in intimidating fellow Syrians by threatening violence against their families back in Syria had been arrested and formally charged in the United States. It happened to my family. Um, my dad appeared at the embassy when we were, we had a demonstration, went upstairs, met with the ambassador, and he gave all of his information, unlike the un other individuals that were there with him. And that same day, my uncles in, in Syria received a visit from the Mukhabarat, the Secret Service, saying, what is your brother up to? And my dad hasn't been to Syria in 40 years. When we go to the White House or the Syrian embassy in protest, we feel that there are many of suspicious people around us and uh, they try to get information from you. This is very typical of the regime and in fact Amnesty has a report, I don't know if you've read it, Amnesty did a report about the Syrian regime's arm in all these different countries in the world, how basically the embassy is just a mafia and they, they collect this information about people. They told my brother literally if they will be in trouble if I wouldn't stop my political activities in the United States. So that was obvious. It was because of the, the filming issue. That's how it's been. Uh, that's the, yeah, that's the way they do it. I think the, 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 the most equivalent society to, to the Syrian one is something fictional I've read in, in George Orwell 1984, like everyone is, is watching you. Uh, the big brother is everywhere. They want you to have basically no brain, no opinion, no say. It's a regime that came into power by, by, by force, not by, by election or by ba ballot boxes. They will do anything, basically, to stay in power because that's their philosophy. They don't believe in peace. They don't believe in democracy. In 1970, a Syrian army general named Hafez Assad seized power in a military coup. He immediately began arresting and imprisoning his rivals in the Arab Socialist Ba'ath Party. Less than a decade later, in neighboring Iraq, Assad's methods would be imitated by another Ba'ath Party leader. A lot of people, especially in my generation, we were like, we were born having Assad, the father, as a president. Despite that we're living in a republic, the, the power was inherited to his son uh, without our choice. So most of the people, they know nothing uh, about the country except that they were born to see Assad family ruling their country. Uh, we've been under dictatorship for almost half a century. And uh, no one really accepts that. Uh, things were quiet before because of the brutal regime that uh, kills in, in prison. Uh, anyone who raises voice, anyone who object or say no to the regime. In the late 1970s, a domestic challenge arose from Sunni Muslims opposed to the secular Ba'ath Party program. A contemporary historian describes the Assad regime's reaction as possibly the single deadliest act by any Arab government against its own people in the modern Middle East. He was challenged by an uprising in the city of Hama in 1982. 40,000 people were killed in one city just because a few people at that city were opposing the, the regime. He surrounded the city and bombarded the city for a whole month and demolished a big part of the city. Uh, the, there is no accurate report, but uh, the, uh, the people who killed ranges between 40,000 and 70,000 people. 
and there are a lot of people that unaccounted for until nowadays. Uh, assume being killed, assume that they've been buried in some mass graves. Some people were jailed like for 20 years and they haven't seen their family. Uh, their family, they don't know if they are alive or dead. Uh, and because of the fear uh, of what happened in Hama in 1982, people were scared to death to say anything. The main reason behind my coming to the U.S. was actually signing a, a petition uh, for Alan Johnson, BBC reporter, who was uh, kidnapped in 2007 by Hamas movement. Uh, and the statement in that petition, we accused the Syrian government, of the Hamas, and, and which was supported by the Syrian government of uh, kidnapping Alan Johnson. And of course, we called for his release. Uh, as a, a result, a reaction of that, the Syrian regime um, considered me as a wanted person. We organized a, a youth group at Damascus University, which calls for secularism, uh, democracy, individual freedom. As a result of that, I was jailed in Syria, and uh, I spent in a prison for like 40 days. Because of my, the Thurwa Foundation of my parents' activism uh, in Damascus, it was, they established an NGO for human rights activism, for civil rights uh, in the region, and of course in Syria, it was on the ground in Damascus. Five, uh, even more, like, uh, Officers came in with their plain clothes. You can't tell that they are officers, but it's obvious in Syria when someone comes with guns and clashing uh, which is a Russian automatic gun, come into a public place and like kicking the door in their like uh, feet and, and come in and they ask us to get our IDs. And I mean, I was back then on a website that is like against the regime. So right away I clicked, uh, I, I, I closed the window so, so they would not see. And then the, the, the owner of the internet cafe, he pointed at two of us, me and my friend. So they just came to us and like they, they beat us, handcuffed us, and, and they, they took us to their car and put us in the trunk of their car. I, became, I couldn't go back to Syria basically because of that statement, along with other activities that I was doing in Lebanon. Um, my cousin uh, was also in Lebanon, so he he decided to go to, uh, to Syria just to visit. He was arrested on the border because of me. And uh, then, of course, I officially knew I was wanted. I couldn't go back to Syria. They drove us like about, uh, I think like about five miles. And then we, we found out that it's like a security. When I saw the president picture hanged on most of the walls at that place. The brother-in-law of uh, Bashar al-Assad, the president, uh, he threatened my parents face to face to be killed uh, if they don't stop their activism and they, if they don't shut down the NGO. I asked one of the, the, the prison guard, do you know how long I would be staying here? And he told me two years. And I believed it. I mean, because I know people who stayed 18 years. I know an old man, he's very famous in Syria, called the Riyadh Turk. He stayed 18 years at the same solitary confinement that I've stayed in. Two years later, the U.S. Embassy in Beirut helped me out to, to get this, you know, refugee and um, make it to the U.S. It's really horrible. You have nothing to do. They take your even watch, so you don't know the time. There's, you don't know the, the morning from the evening. Uh, they, they don't give you any kind of papers, any pen, anything. You don't have anything in the, in, the, in the solitary confinement except for yourself. After that, we had to go because, I mean, <laughs> it was not safe for us at all. After releasing me, I, I managed to escape the country and I was wandering between many countries until I ended up in, in the United States with the help of the uh, American embassy in Beirut. I didn't have any breakfast, any lunch. Well, Rami, we're going now to his hospital. He's at the hospital. He smuggled himself to Lebanon before the revolution. 
and even the uh, uh, border pat patrol in, in, in Syria, they, they shot fire in him, but nothing happened to him. Uh, he was the one who was responsible on, on, on taking, on building a big network of uh, uh, reporters on the ground to take the information what's happening in Syria from inside the country to outside. And uh, the Syrian regime tried to assassinate them in Lebanon. They entered to his flat, but he was not there. And later on, the American, they brought him here for his safety. While he's at the hospital, he had the surgery and uh, he's on medication. He asked me to get his computer and I mean, when I get back home yesterday, I was surprised to see him tweeting still on, on Facebook, Twitter and like connecting the dissidents with each other. So I'm going there now to, to check on him, see how is he doing. Absolutely, since the beginning of the uprising, none of us have really his normal life. We are almost like 24 hours working in, uh, uh, in online, communicating, trying to do tons of tasks in different, in different domains. From communicating with people in the ground, trying to get information out, uh, helping with uh, the logistic, logistic aid, sometimes with blood bags, sometimes with... Uh, like all the stuff they needed in the ground in Syria. For instance, I wrote a couple of articles like Wall Street Journal, Daily Beast, Foreign Affairs magazine about dissidents inside these countries and what they have been through. We basically are cyber dissidents nowadays because we can't just uh, be in the country. So what we do is supporting this revolution uh, through uh, internet, uh, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, uh, or even YouTube. A few years ago, I, I, I joined a group called Cyber Dissidents, which is an American-based, along with a friend of mine, David Keyes, who is the executive director of the organization. And uh, we started a, 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 this group in order to highlight the dissidents in the Arab world, even before any revolution have started, that they are using the Facebook, Twitter, uh, uh, also blogs. For example, the other day, I was... Uh, on online and I, a friend from inside the country uh, asked me uh, if I could write some signs in English for them uh, so they can, you know, hold them. We're able to leak a big database from Syria which has Syrian people phone numbers, cell phone numbers. All of them are young people and we start to send messages to their cell phone which is very good in the Syrian situation to have a direct contact with your audience. There is a lot of work in the political level, meetings with the embassies here, talking to the people who are trying to make the decision about Syria and leading for more international pressure about Syria. We try to raise awareness here. We try to um, tell the world that we are suffering from this regime. We have been like for a long time. And they are killing pe not only like protesters, they're killing kids, they're killing women, they're killing older people, they're attacking houses, they're raping, they're stealing, just because they want to stay in power and they think that they own Syria. As Bashar Assad owns Syria, his family owns Syria. This is part of what we do, supporting people uh, morally and uh, even financially. Some uh, Syrian-American uh, businessmen uh, offered um, and they did actually help a lot of uh, uh, injured, uh, a lot of uh, people who uh, flee the country to Lebanon and Turkey. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about the refugee camps uh, and also on the ground supporting them by um, equipment, uh, whether cameras, uh, computers, laptops. Uh, when the Arab Spring started, you know, of course, Tunisia sort of happened quickly and we didn't recognize what was going on. Um, Egypt just sort of like we were following that. I think my, even my own business got impacted by what was going on in Egypt. I'm like, come on, guys, let's finish this off. I need to go back to work. Uh, none of us really, I think many of us doubted that anything will happen in Syria. But when, when the Arab Spring first started, I, I do believe that Syria is a part of this movement, big movement. We, we didn't really have any, any hope. We were so unoptimistic about 
anything that would happen in Syria because we always knew that the regime is very brutal. They were able to brainwash people for, for the last decades. We grew up in schools teaching us how great is the president. And the majority of people, majority of Syrian people were like this. We think that Assad is, is, is the greatest person in the world. We saw like Egyptians, where they toppled uh, Hosni Mubarak, Tunisians are having their elections now and they're moving forward, the Libyans, they caught uh, Gaddafi. To my surprise, I was just sitting at that day, March the 14th, uh, the 15th, and I saw a friend of mine updating his Facebook status. He said, I can hear the voices of freedom coming from this crowdy souk in Al-Hamidiyya. And I didn't believe it, but I know this guy is very credible. And then I, I, I start to go to other pages of friends and all of them, they, 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 they really said, this is happening. And a few minutes I saw a YouTube video of that. And few young guys were marching in the street, chanting freedom, freedom. And, and, and the whole crowd and the souk, which is souk mean market, start to, 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 to chant the same. It, we, we really were amazed. And I knew it's, it's just going to be a snowball and, and it's, we're going to end up with removing this regime. The situation now in Syria is like people started to, to, to speak for their rights. We've been living in a country that was uh, literally isolated. People were really submissive or silent uh, and they didn't really speak against the oppression that they have been under for decades. Now we have people that they are going to the street, they're putting their lives under threat and the real danger and, and, and risk while facing in their chest the, 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 the bullets from, from the, the police and the army. In Egypt, the revolution um, uh, lasted for 18 uh, days and then Mubarak was gone. In Syria, it's been for over eight months. Yet uh, the reason is uh, because simply in Egypt, uh, the military didn't back, uh, back up uh, Mubarak and once he started killing people, they told him, military people told him to, to leave and he did. But in Syria, these people, all high-ranking um, uh, officers of um, the Syrian military, whether the Air Force or Army, are actually from the Alawi uh, sects who are uh, loyal to the Assad family. And I still remember when we heard the, when I heard the news about what's going on in Dara and, and, and the children being arrested and the rallies going out, just sitting there and just crying. So it was just very emotional. At this t moment, I'm sure that hundreds are being arrested, houses are being destroyed, people are being shot on the street. The international community will not stood aside all this time and watching a criminal regime killing non-violence non protesters. protesters. They will, they will do something, like, sooner or later. Last week, in one day, 2,000 people got arrested. And every day we hear 40 here, 30 here, in different cities. So far, we have the documented number. is more than 4,000 people were killed. And I can assure for you the number is higher than that, because the 4,000 names that we have is names that we were sure that they were killed. It's, it's, it's much, much higher than what the UN and local human rights organization uh, uh, announced, because no one uh, knows the exact number. A lot of families, they're afraid of killing their, announcing their death, so uh, they just try to keep it uh, as secret as possible. Some friends who live in Syria really think that the number is more than 8,000 of people who were killed in the country because of the regime. I have friends who are arrested and I don't know where they are right now. I hope they're alive. If you got like, if you got shoot, shoot it by a bullet in Syria, you cannot have this medical aid and people are really shoot it by a bullet and they were talking to us on phone. I, I had this experience. Someone was talking to me at the phone and he told me, okay, I cannot take a talk anymore because I have bullet in my leg. So I will give the phone for someone else. At the beginning, they didn't, they didn't call for the toppling of Assad regime. But then Assad regime, he used the force and killed a lot of peaceful protesters. People started to call for the downfall of Assad until we reached a point when we, we saw really hundreds of thousands of people occupying main squares in Syria and chanting to double down Assad regime. Even they chanted for the execution of Assad. 
So the problem is, is bigger than the head of the regime. We, yes, we want to get rid of Bashar, but what you want is to remove this complete system. It's just think of it as a pyramid, and he's at the top. Since the, the, this uh, movement in Syria have, uh, have, uh, has started and, and, and people start to go in mass numbers to the street, the, the traditional Syrian opposition, which used to be even since the 80s until now, started to think in more practical way to make a political face for this revolution. As the revolution started, one of the things that happened, you had Syrians in, in different cities meeting together, trying to f figure out a way to influence U.S. policy to take the, U the Syrian story to the American public. So there have been many initiatives, a lot of conferences happened, and it took them a long time. At the end, the majority of the opposition, they agreed on one umbrella, which is called the Syrian National Council which is a, a group of, of opposition parties, a group of social uh, institutions like the tribes in Syria, and also minorities, which including Alawite and Christians. I, I am a member of the recently formed Syrian National Council, and I'm board member with Derizzo Revolutionary uh, Council. Uh, absolutely, I'm in favor of Syrian National Council. I'm a member of the Syrian National Council. And you have Muslim Brotherhood, of course, because they also uh, uh, have some representation in, in, in the Syrian community. First of all, I support the SNC because the Syrian people, the revolution on the inside, has given their support to the SNC. If they had not, then I would not have either. So for me, I feel like my role as a Syrian American is to support the revolutionaries on the inside and what it is that they're demanding. And if they've chosen a political vehicle that's called the SNC, then I'm going to be supporting that. A lot of Christians are not represented on this uh, council. A lot of Kurds are not represented. And uh, also, the, the, the majority of uh, its members are coming from Islamic backgrounds. So there's some groups that were not represented yet, but I believe they would be joining the, the, the council. When it comes to the minority, the Kurdish, for example, they did their own national, they established their own national council, which is the Kurdish National Council, a KNC. Uh, while there is another Syrian national council, why is that happening? Because these people, as I mentioned, the Syrian national council, are coming from outside. Whoever is outside, his role or her role is to support uh, the revolution inside. Leadership comes from inside. The council was welcomed by many countries such as United States, France and European Union. However, they didn't yet recognize them as a representative of the Syrian people. We need to support the Free Syrian Army. Uh, that is, the soldiers and the generals that are defecting uh, and they're refusing to, sh to shoot the people and to kill them. So we need support from the Arab League and the, from the international community. The total uh, uh, amount of people uh, who, jo who have joined the Syrian, military, uh, the Syrian uh, Free uh, Army is only 15,000. That's, that's nothing. Uh, the Syrian Free Army, it's a really a controversial topic. We really support any soldier who want to defect from the military. We really support anyone who want to protect civilian because this is their duty. This is their promise. This is what they want. But we are really, we are really worried about them. There is no uh, coordination between, among these people. We do not want to engage in any military operation. We do not want to move the revolution to a violent revolution before we make sure 100% we can win it. And you can't sit and see Russia, for instance, giving the Syrian army and Assad weapons to kill the people while the people are being killed with no intervention. Russia, Russia, don't you care? Syrian bodies everywhere! Syrian bodies everywhere! Russia, Russia, don't you care? Russia, Russia, don't you care? Syrian bodies everywhere! Syrian bodies everywhere! How many have to die? How many have to die? The, what the Arab League is doing now, they taking, uh, they taking, uh, they putting pressure with this, they putting pressure on the China, in China and Russia, so they cannot anymore go to veto in the Security Council. If it's not possible to have a ground troops to go inside Syria, at least to support the defected soldiers to have some Arabic 
countries, which I believe if the, if the United States want that, everybody would follow, to have Arabic countries to go and protect the civilians in Syria. And maybe the international intervention have many steps. Maybe the first step it will be like by, uh, by sending international, uh, like the Blue Hat, to monitor the situation in Syria and the ground. Then later military operation. So people in Syria have called now for a no-fly zone. It came from the people. People here in the United States are sensitive or insecure about it because they are looking at the Iraqi experience. The people on the ground raised banners saying we need international protection, we need no-fly zone, we need, uh, we need the UN to help us. A revolution that has been peaceful since its beginning, since like seven, eight months, and it maintained the status quo of being peaceful despite the, the killing, despite that the soldiers of the Syrian army has really uh, have been really committing a really serious crimes, raping women, killing children, arresting and torturing people. We are really in favor of a uh, buffer zone, so all the soldiers they can go there, they can they can train there, they can maintain their uh, their skills, and they can obtain or maybe uh, more weapon. And this option will be available whenever it needed. The U.S. is helpful but not helpful enough yet and not only the US we need Europe also they're not doing enough uh, obviously we don't even have complete economic sanctions yet we need a bigger Western role European and American what is needed what needed is actually to 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 basically help people on the ground meet with opposition figures and, and, and try to to look for a post asset era we need these uh, oil companies to stop, you know, um, you know, investing in Syria. Ninety percent of the oil, the Syrian oil, is invested by oil companies, and that's how they're funding, you know, the the army and killing the people. We all expected that the U.S. will be uh, the first factor to topple this regime. We want the European and the American to guarantee the rights of minority, to guarantee the right of secular in Syria, which I believe they are the majority. The regime that has caused the U.S. thousands of uh, death uh, well, well, while they were fighting against uh, liberating Iraq and the, regime, the Syrian regime were dispatching uh, terrorists to, to kill uh, U.S. Uh, soldiers. Yet the U.S. reaction toward this regime or, or cooperating to topple this regime was uh, very weak. The Turkish now are taking the lead. And the Turkish, despite that they are uh, uh, somehow now siding with the people of Syria, but at the end they would be siding with the people who are look like them as the government, like the Erdogan government, the Islamic people. I was just listening to this, uh, to this concept of transitional justice. Yeah, that's what they did in South Africa. I think the country is going to have to really figure that one out when, when we get to that point. But I think many, many people who have had close relatives, fathers, sons, mothers killed are going to struggle with that. A lot of people um, inside and outside of Syria believe that once the regime uh, is gone, then Islamists will take over. Well, I'm not uh, an Islamist. Uh, I don't... Uh, uh, I disagree with their ideas of creating an Islamic state in the whole region. But if they come by uh, uh, elections, if people uh, decided to, uh, to elect them, then why not? These people won't be dictators. They won't be able to impose their ideologies and their beliefs on us. This regime is putting the fear in the people that if we leave, you're going to have sectarian war and uh, uh, Christian going to be prosecuted and all that uh, talk, which is nonsense. This is not true. It's not going to happen. The regime has worked on the Alawite sect for a while. They kind of um, portray that once we're gone, and uh, once the regime is gone, then a uh, civil war will happen. Sunnis, Muslim Sunnis will kill uh, Alawite and other Shia. And of course, this is not true. Syria has been a diverse community for hundreds of years, and we've lived together for, for hundreds of years. Um, the Christian community in Syria lived with the Sunni community, even when, when France came to occupy Syria. Um, I was surprised when I saw uh, the Kurdish flag uh, uh, holding by Arabs in southern uh, 
southern parts of Syria. When it comes to the Assad, I think he should be put on trial. And I, definitely him and everybody who's been responsible you know, for the bloodshed in Syria, especially that, that ruling class. Clearly, Assad has lost his legitimacy. You can't kill your people and then talk about reform and transition to democracy. I mean, it's all, it's, it's too late for that now. I want to have my right as a, a, a person, as an immigrant who's living in the United States and can go and visit his home country whenever he wants. That he would not be afraid to go there and, and see his friends and sitting with his family and look at his memories, go to the places that I grew up in. We're exiled here. It's not a choice that we made. It was, we, we were forced actually. And myself, I was not really wanting to leave Syria. I was I always wanted to stay there. I did not understand how, as a teenager at that time, I did not understand how if I want to change like something in my country, if I want to be able to say something that I believe in, and democracy and freedom, why would I be kicked out of my country? And But then now I can see, you know, uh, I understand that kind of dictatorship system and um, I see the revolution happening and I see that people are not going to be silent anymore. Like the revolution cannot stop. We, uh, uh, it will not stop because I'm in the hospital getting Assad to court, suing him and all his thugs, all his criminal gang. When we are there, we believe that we really now delivered our message. Then it's somebody else should take and yeah. Yeah.